Hello and welcome to the Weekly Wind-Up with me, Kyle Warwick. Joining me on this week's programme are Mike James and Alison Munro. This week we will be looking at the TTIP deal that is currently being hammered out between the EU and the US and we will also look at the imminent introduction of charges for carrier bags. Firstly, we take a look at TTIP, or Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, to give it its full title. This is a trade deal currently being negotiated between the European Union on behalf of its members and the United States. There were grumblings about the deal and the secrecy of what it contains at the end of last year, but since the general election things have gone a little quiet. Negotiations are still ongoing and those involved in the negotiations remain fairly tight-lipped about a deal that could possibly affect every facet of your life. From food production, to education, to road maintenance, to the ability of nationally elected governments to rule themselves. Some of the hypothesising has been dismissed offhand as scaremongering by lefties, but until till the deal becomes fully public we may never know how true that assertion actually is. Before we speak to our guests, let's find out what the people of Huddersfield know about TTIP. I know it's gone to, through Parliament, it's a way of um, ending our ability to decide what, what happens to, with our industries, um, giving multinational capitalism more authority over our small and large businesses, including the NHS. If, if a government makes some legislation that they feel is, is not in their interests, then they have a right to sue the government. In other words, it's obviously, you know, totally undemocratic. TTIP is going to allow big corporations to uh, bypass human rights laws um, and just let the working class suffer. Welcome to the programme, Mike. Thank you. Firstly, I'd, I'd like to ask, are you surprised by how informed the people of Huddersfield are about TTIP? I'm very pleased that they are actually becoming rather more informed. I've been campaigning, I suppose, over the last 12 months with 38 degrees um, about TTIP. And because there's so little information coming out through the media, uh, the majority of people that I spoke to in the early days knew very little about it. But the last time that we went out, which was over the summer, I was surprised and, and really quite pleased by the number of people who uh, at least had an awareness of what TTE, TTIP might mean, although of course uh, they pick up different things because so little is, is there for us really to get hold of because it's so secret. Yeah. And uh, why do you feel people on the street should care about TTIP? Well, I, I think when you said that it's likely to have an impact on almost every aspect of our lives, I, I think that's probably an understatement. It will have an impact on absolutely every area. Um, and therefore, it will have um, what seems to me to be a, a, a bad effect, really, on the majority of consumers' lives, because we're likely to find ourselves really at the mercy of multinational corporations. One of the ladies on the television uh, clip there just, just said the same sort of thing. And it's really because um, the balance of power seems to be weighted so much in favour of big business rather than the consumer. And over the possibly the last century or so, uh, the legislation that we've had in place to protect consumers looks like it could become uh, something of the past really uh, and that we would find ourselves really having to toe the line of what big business wanted. This is very much about profits before people. Right. Um, you, you said there it was almost an understatement. Uh, my understanding from some of the politicians that have spoken about TTIP, certainly the ones that are in favour of it, they speak about the NHS being kept out of the deal. In your understanding, is that likely to be the case? I don't think it can be. I think there are people who, of course, are in favour of TTIP and they're in favour of it for different reasons. Um, some politicians see the potential 
of jobs coming to this country, of course, as being the main thing. And, you know, who wouldn't want that? Because that's very much like motherhood and apple pie. Everybody wants jobs in the UK. I think what, what they also feel, of course, is that, that that might be the side of it from a political point of view. But what we don't know, of course, is how many of those people would actually gain from it financially as well. Um, because they may well be um, shareholders in multinational corporations and therefore will benefit that way too. And it seems to me that it's the, the, the trade-off between what is the potential gain, and it is only a potential gain, the figures, even, even by those who are in favour, recognise that it's actually worth 0.5 of a percent of the GDP in the USA, 0.4 of a percent of the GDP in the European Union, of improvements from things like regulation, coordination as they call it, um, or cooperation. But the, the potential um, dangers, I think, for us all are only just below the surface as we recognise that, in fact, multinationals will have the capacity to sue um, nations uh, and legislative bodies that want to change regulations which might have an impact on that particular company's profits. As I say, profits, not people. Yeah. Alison, how do you feel about the possibility of well, corporations and companies suing governments for the decisions well, that it's, they make? I mean, I've, I've, um, I'm, I heard briefly about um, this, uh, this subject only probably about 12 months ago, and then it seemed to die out of the, um, disappear from the media. Um, and so I've just been doing, a, obviously I knew I was coming on the programme today, so I've just done a little bit of research, and I'm actually quite shocked that, um, about the implications if this goes ahead. And um, I think, you know, the fact that they would have authority, that all this capitalism will have authority over people and countries is a terrible thing. Um, and it certainly isn't something that we should get involved in in our country. But I'm really interested to know if the Tories uh, are supporting TITP. I just wondered if you... If you knew that. I, th I think there are, there are sceptics, of course, on, on both sides. And in all the major parties, there are some people who actually think it's a good idea. Because, as I say, it, it, it theoretically will bring jobs. But um, there are people, of course, who are saying at the moment that they won't, they won't necessarily uh, come down on one side or the other until they know a little bit more about it. My fears, and I think, I think the fears of a lot of people, are that we're going to be presented with something which will be very much take it or leave it, and there will be the promise of a certain number of jobs, but where those jobs turn out to be, of course, nobody knows, um, and that there will be an increase in the economic activity between the two, you know, enormous sort of economic, I mean, 50% of the world's trade happens between these, these, these two areas. Um, you, you know, those benefits are going to be outweighed by, by the, the consumer's lack of ability to do anything about things that go wrong. And if we take the case of the Volkswagen, where, you know, a business here has not acted in an ethical sense. You know, we know that we are going to be up against things which mean that there is, is so much money backing that particular view that the ordinary person, the ordinary people, are going to find it very difficult to have an impact on um, what a big, big company really wants to be able to do. And I think we're going to find ourselves even more disadvantaged than perhaps we have been in the past. Yeah. Um, should we be worried about um, falling standards in regulation? I mean, certainly in America, they have a lot looser regulations on food and on the kind of standards set out before medicine is released to the public. Should we, we be worried about that? It, it certainly is a fear, and it's certainly a fear that I've got, that, that, that there will be a race to the bottom, uh, and that what people will want, or what companies will want to do, is to go with the least regulation they can possibly go with. Um, and, and I think, you know, you, you can't sort of, you can't really blame the Americans for, for the whole of this, because, you know, in the past they've had 
uh, various activists like Ralph Nader in the 70s and 80s who increased the road safety and passenger safety uh, in the States to a point really where it had to be followed in the, U in, in the European Union just to be able to sell cars in the States. And we have in, in the European Union a much tighter regulation over food. But without these people who've, who've been able to work in the past in such a way as to improve the rights of, of the ordinary consumer, we're going to struggle, I think, in the future. And because the way the TTIP seems as though it's going to be set up, any company which feels that its profits are going to be affected by a decision which is made uh, by a legislative body in Europe, then they have to be consulted. This company has to be consulted. And it will happen unless that legislation, or less legislative body, can make a really good case that in fact this is going to be to the, be to the detriment of the majority of people. Mm -hmm. So by taking out what you could consider to be vexatious claims against a, 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 a country, then I think that it seems that the, the balance of power is going to be weighted very, very firmly in favour of particularly multinationals, um, but any powerful com company in any country. Yeah. So to what extent do you think that maybe hyperbole from one side and a lack of clarity from the other is s preventing real discussion around TTIP? I mean, to come back to the point that you made earlier about the NHS and whether the NHS can be kept out of the deal, my feeling is, of course, that it can't. Um, already, a number of services from the NHS are in privatised hands and therefore any privatised company will become part of the TTIP deal and so we will be, we will find ourselves uh, at the beck and call and certainly at, at the demands if you like um, for the uh, the people who have the majority of interest in, in delivering those services, um, they, will, they will be the ones who will end up dictating what will actually happen. Um, we, we think again perhaps uh, of a situation where one particular person, uh, somebody who was a, a hedge fund manager, bought the rights to a company and increased the um, cost 5,000% just overnight because he said profits are good. Now, you know, a 32-year-old hedge fund manager who has no money worries did not put himself in the position of the people who actually need those drugs yeah. and did not act in an ethical sense at all. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that if TTIP's in the position of, of being introduced, we might well find ourselves in similar positions by people who, who really lack any ethical values in life about what might happen to the other people that live with them. Mm -hmm. So certainly from listening to you today and some of the research that I've done, it, it, it sounds like a, an almost a, a move away from a true democratic process to almost an, an oligarchy really, a, a ruling of nations by the, the richest. I, I think that's true uh, and certainly the, the examples that, that, that we give of, of these very very large companies who seem to have been able to run things really according to them according to the, their own desires and, and gain a market share not, not, in a, not in a legitimate fashion well how are we going to find out that these companies are acting legitimately in the future it seems to me that what's going to happen with very, very large companies who can sort out deals between themselves over what you and I are able to buy, that we, if we allow this to happen, we're really going to be putting the foxes in charge of the hen house. And uh, finally, I, I know you mentioned earlier about 38 degrees. If, if somebody was wanting to get involved, find out a bit more about TTIP or maybe even start campaigning against it, where would you advise them to go to work? I think there's a number of sites and, and uh, quite a lot of people that I've spoken to say, well, I really need to find, you know, be, even before they've signed, signed my, my petitions, they've said, well, I really need to find out a bit more about it. And I'd say, 
you, what they need to do is to look for, there are quite a number of good, um, very short uh, TTIP explained videos on YouTube. There is, interestingly, one which is very pro um, TTIP, um, and I noticed that they have the comment section so that it's not active. You can't actually say what you think about their video. But there are a lot of very good ones, so don't go for the first one, is, 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 my, is my sort of suggestion. But also read art articles from things like The Guardian, just so that you feel a little bit more able to sort of feel, actually, I've got as much information as I possibly can. I, c I can see how this might impact on me personally. Mm. Uh, and that's really why I should do something about it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mike, Alison, thank you for the time being. Okay. So I'm afraid that's all we have time for on this topic. As always, the weekly wind-up can be contacted by email, info at kirkleyslocaltv.com. We can be found on Twitter by searching at the weekly wind-up. And you can also find KL TV on Facebook by searching Kirkley's Local TV. Now on to some local news. Reported in the Huddersfield Examiner on the 25th of September, the suffragette past is being brought vividly to life in an exclusive film event. The Warrens Backwith Theatre is behind the project, which is part of a season of films spotlighting women's achievements on a global scale. Starting in St George's Square, a promenade performance will follow the Huddersfield suffragette trail, with audiences being greeted by characters such as Emmeline Pankhurst and Huddersfield's own Dora Thewlis, the baby suffragette. People will walk in the footsteps of Emmeline Pankhurst herself, who made a prominent visit to the town in 1906. The promenade ends at the LBT with a special preview and first West Yorkshire screening of Suffragette, the first feature film to recount the struggle for votes for women and due for release in October. Suffragette will be screened at the LBT at 7.30pm on Sunday, October the 11th. The promenade starts at St George's Square at 6pm. That's all we have time for in this half of the programme. Join me after the break when we will be discussing the introduction of mandatory charges for plastic bags. However large or small your business, Attracting new customers requires dedication and a lot of patience. Just like fishing, but you also need the right gear. Rods, reels, lines, hooks, sinkers, lures, tackle box, tackle bag, net, bait, gas gloves, clothes, and pocket knife lunch. Or you could simply advertise with KLTV. Online, grow your business and your clientele. KLTV, your vision made reality. Should have gone to KLTV. And welcome back. Before we discuss the introduction of charges for plastic bags, we're going to look at some more news from around Huddersfield. Reported in the Examiner on the 28th of September, the search is on for Huddersfield's best design buildings. Huddersfield Civic Society holds its design awards every year and is now appealing for both its members and the public to name their favourite buildings in each of the categories. Nominations are needed for five categories. Best New Development, Best Shopfront, Best Refurbishment, Best Residential Development and the Examiner Reader's Award. Last year, the overall winner, St Peter's Church, won the Best Refurbishment and the Examiner Reader's Award. Nominated buildings should fall within the former Huddersfield Borough boundary, that is between Outlane and Fixby in the north, Berrybrow and Almondbury in the south, Milnes Bridge in the west and Cooper Bridge and Waterloo in the east. Projects must have been completed between July 1st 2013 and December 31st 2015. People have until New Year's Eve to submit their choices. Now on to our second major topic, the introduction of charges for carrier bags at supermarkets. On the 5th of October this year, all English sellers, these being a person who sells goods and employs over 250 people, will be expected to charge a minimum 5p for any single usage carrier bags. A single usage carrier bag is any unused bag made of lightweight plastic material with handles. 
Plastic is one of the biggest pollutants on the planet and governments are keen to cut down on the amount of waste from plastic products. In 2014, nearly 8 billion bags were given out by supermarkets in the UK alone. This is enough to wrap around the earth 100 times. Whilst each year there is enough plastic thrown away to circle the earth four times. Ireland was the first European country to impose a tax on plastic bags. This led to a decrease in plastic shopping bag consumption by 90%. Before we speak to our guests, we asked the people of Huddersfield what they thought about the introduction of the charge. I'm not too keen on it. I prefer the, the way it is at the moment, but uh, I guess can't really do much, really. No problem, really, because it's been going on for years, varying from a penny up to five pence over the last three years. Too many people just have to have a bag just for the sake of it. And they don't think what they do with the carry bag after. It means that everybody's going to take a bag with them when they when they go for the uh, the groceries or whatever they're buying. And uh, for the smallest bag, you're going to have to pay five pence, and it's just a rip off. Welcome to the program, Alison. Welcome back. Some varied comments there, let's say. How do you feel about some of those comments from the people? Of well, I'm quite surprised, actually, because uh, a few people seem to be against um, the introduction of a, a tax on plastic bags. But uh, perhaps they'd be interested to know that um, it's taken this country 22 years since the first tax on bags came into existence in Denmark um, for us to actually introduce this law. Um, so it's it's well over well overdue, um, and my personal view is that it doesn't actually go far enough. It's not far-reaching enough, um, because if 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 these people who who um, if they really knew what this plastic was actually doing to us and and to to the world, um, you know, they'd be absolutely shocked. And the fact is, we can all do something about it. So um, I think it's very important that this that. Uh, this, I'm so pleased that this legislation, legislation has actually been introduced at last. Um, and as I say, it's only taken 22 years for us to actually do something about it, which is terrible. Um, I mean, for example, um, it's only applying to uh, companies with employees over 250. Um, and that means effectively supermarkets or large, large organisations. Um, I think the view is to include small businesses eventually, but I think they should be included now. Mm. Um, I mean, some countries have a, um, already have blanket, a blanket policy whereby um, they have a complete ban on plastic bags. Uh, for example, Italy. Italy has a complete ban. Uh, some of the African countries have a complete ban. Um, in France, you can, you can be paying anything between 2p and 42p for a plastic bag. Um, so 5p really is is a drop in the ocean and um, you know what people don't realize is that the plastic in these plastic bags it actually never really decomposes it's always going to be always going to be with us uh, some plastics give off toxins they're buried in landfill sites I've, I've been to landfill sites and they take you know we're talking over a hundred years for some plastics to decompose they give off toxins while the toxic gases while they're decomposing, and they eventually form a liquid. But plastic bags actually never degrade; they just they just uh, form crystals, so they're with us forever, and they're toxic. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I've seen images of plastic rafts in the oceans and things like that. The 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 size of which are, are insane, and when you look at the reduction that Ireland has got, I mean, 90% reduction in, in usage. Mm. You, I find it hard to understand why people would be against the introduction of a ban. But on the other hand, I know that a lot of supermarkets already charge, within, within the costing of your food, there is the charge for mm. your plastic mm. bags. So is it fair when I'm almost certain that supermarkets will not reduce the cost of the food, is it fair then to place an extra burden onto the consumer? Well, I think um, to a certain extent, yes, yes it is, because um, 
it, it, it's giving us a choice. We don't actually have to buy a, buy a plastic bag. We don't have to actually have to take a plastic bag. And I think that charge is just reminding us that actually this, you know, you, you're getting this bag, you're buying it, but actually it's bad for the environment. So we're going to charge you for that. Uh, you know, people have a choice. You can take your own bag along to the supermarket. I used to, uh, for a brief time, lived in Germany. And in Germany in 1996, people were taking their shopping baskets to the supermarket, which I thought was a brilliant idea. And when I moved back, you know, I, I'd plonk my basket in the trolley going around whichever supermarket. I'd be looked at as if I was, I'd come from Mars or something. But over in Europe, you know, all those years ago, people were doing that. And, you know, n nobody batted an eyelid. And I think it's, it's, much, it's a much better way um, you know, to shop and, and better for the environment. Yeah. I think it's something that addresses the symptoms rather than the problem. Uh, because there we'll see, you've always been able to take your shopping bag to the supermarket, you know, when we've, ha we've had plastic bags anyway. It, it became a convenience. And mm -hmm. yes, you know, I, I wouldn't sort of say, no, let's, let's not charge for it. But I, I think what there has to be is a, rather more of a fundamental um, education process so that people are, are much more careful about um, all of their plastic products. If we take, for example, a, a product which by and large is not needed, but people use anyway, and that's things like bottled water. You know, in the UK there is water in the tap which you can drink just like that for free. You don't have to buy it. It doesn't come in a plastic wrapper. You know, why not have a much greater education on how we use plastic and, and think about the impact that it has on the environment rather than just focusing on what is really a very, very small area. I know it has, you know, it's a small area in terms of total plastics used. It might be, you know, it, it's just a very visible area. Um, and I think that's, that's another one of these things where you could say that, you know, respective governments have really just looked at trying to, to, to show that they're paying really lip service to the environment rather than actually more than doing something about it which is going to have a lasting impact. Yeah. I mean in that vein and as well, uh, as well legislation, talking about legislation as well, it is possible to create highly recyclable plastics. Should there not be, do you think Mike, maybe more legislation brought in to enforce the production of easily recyclable plastics. Yeah, I mean it's a good idea, isn't it? You know, what happens when TTIP comes in? Do we get do we get anywhere then? I think the mm. answer is going to be no. Mm. You know, while we've got the opportunity, yes, it makes an awful lot of sense, doesn't it, mm. to have to have mixes of plastics which which will degrade even if they are rather that if, even if they are that little bit more expensive than than the current uh, um, generation of bags are because you know, it, it, it is about protecting the environment for the future and certainly for, for the wildlife, you know, the sustainability of which is really struggling. You know, you, you say you've seen the, the rafts of plastics on the most remote islands, you know, there are clearly enormous quantities of plastic being sort of washed up. So yes, you know, there have to be, there has to be legislation because, you know, left to the devices, if you like, of, of big business, it won't happen that way. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Alison? Oh yes, I mean, yeah, and we need to do, well, we're doing something at last, but more needs to be done definitely in needs regulating and uh, we need to, everybody needs to be much more focused on, you know, how we can look after the environment and the wildlife that we've got and protect the world for, for the future for everybody. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I mean, certainly for me, it's, it's always quite confusing just on a, just on a scale of, of my own house knowing which plastics I'm actually able to put into my green recycling bin mm. and which plastics I can't. And, and it's often told to you in the form of a code. Do you think there could be maybe clearer labelling and clearer understanding coming from the council regarding the kind of plastics that you could recycle? Yeah. Well, I mean, on your bins, you, you, they have a kind of a, a, sim, a chart with symbols on a, what you can and can't put in. But, but I'm just wondering perhaps if manufacturers could put, a, say, a one on for plastics that go in the grey bin and a two on for plastics that go in the green bin. Something simple like that. That's right. I think, so, I think it's interesting, though, isn't it? Because, you know, think about Kirklees and Calderdale. I used to live in Calderdale. 
that you can recycle different things, mm. of, of different plastics mm. in, in Calderdale's bins compared with um, Kirk Lee's bins. Mm. You know, one goes for the bottle, for the milk bottle, if you're using plastic milk mm. bottles, the other one goes for the top. Now, you know, which, which ones are going to be? You, have to ha you would have to have a much more uniform system, really, to be able to effectively make, you know, recycling uh, doable on the, on mm. the sort of... I mean, it would be nice to be able to do that, wouldn't it? So it that everybody knew, yeah. and you knew that if you went to Reading, you, you, you put this in that particular bin and that one in the other mm. bin. But at the moment, of course, that's just not the case. In fact, interestingly enough, it's the same operator in Kirk Lees and in Col Calderdale who are responsible for the recycling, mm. but they both have different types of mm. um, plastics that mm. they, they recycle. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if that's something to do with the plants that are available, could, you know, the local uh, who, mm -hmm. who do the recycling for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's interesting. And then finally, Alison, do you think that this will have a marked effect on, on consumption of plastic bags and ultimately the effect that those have on the environment? I hope so, because, I mean, um, I know, cer you know certain stores have... Um, introduced a, a, um, a small you know, fee for a, a bag for a, quite a while now. And if you think, they always remind you, oh, do you want a bag? You think, oh, I'm, I'm paying for that. Well, actually, no, I'll manage. Um, and I think, it, I think it is off-putting. And I think it really does make you think, no, I, no I'll do with that. And I'll actually manage and you know, take them home with me, whatever, however you know, that will be. But um, yeah, so I think it will, I mean, it ha you know, looking at all the figures that I've seen, uh, from other countries, I think it will. I think it will cut down on the on people using plastic bags, uh, and become history. Hopefully, indeed. Well, <laughs> thank you both for your time. Okay. Thank you to my guests. Now on to some more local news. Reported in Hud the Huddersfield Examiner on the 29th of September, Huddersfield Giants wing star Jermaine McGilvery, delighted with his Hud uh, Dream Team award. The man of the moment, Jermaine, has admitted being selected for the Super League Dream Team has given him another huge boost in confidence. The informed Giants winger has chosen for the competition's imaginary team of the season for the first time to reward an outstanding 2015 campaign. The 27-year-old is Super League's top try scorer with 27, 13 of which have come in the Super 8s. And McGilvery admits things couldn't be going much better for him. To ch be chosen for the Dream Team just a week after being named the Giants Player of the Year is massive for me, Jermaine. He's joined in the Dream Team by Giants Captain Danny Bruff. As always, the weekly wind-up can be contacted by email, info at kirkleyslocaltv.com. We can be found on Twitter if you search at the weekly wind-up. And you can also find KLTV on Facebook by searching Kirkley's local TV. Thank you and goodbye.